Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the AIPG Lunch and Earn Seminar for April. I'm really pleased to have everyone with us today. Just a couple of very quick housekeeping notes. Uh, in the past, uh, we've asked that you put your name in the chat. Uh, we don't need to do that anymore as we've upgraded our software a bit. We do ask that you stay on for the full webinar uh, to receive your certificate. Uh, if you don't attend the full webinar, you won't necessarily receive a certificate. Also, uh, if, we, if you have a question, you can certainly put that in the chat at the end, or you can raise your hand and one of us will unmute you so that you're able to ask that question and comment on our presentation today. Today's presenter, I am very pleased uh, to have him with us, is Vitor Correa. Uh, Vitor and I have come to know each other quite well over the past uh, five or six years. Uh, he has uh, more than, well, nearly 30 years of experience providing expertise on strategic management, uh, innovation, and organizational effectiveness, especially uh, in projects that have diverse value change. Um, he's founded and managed uh, several companies in the geosciences with operations around the globe, including Europe, Africa, and South America. He's also been involved in evaluating mining projects and developing strategies for the World Bank and for the African Development Bank. He's been a part of several EU-funded projects. He's an in-house consultant at the European Federation of Geologists and the International uh, Raw Materials Observatory, which he helped to found. He's a member of the expert group on resource classifications of the UN Economic Commission for Europe and the Secretary General of the International Raw Materials Observatory and past president of the European Federation of Geologists. And if that's not enough, he's uh, really a Renaissance man, a fantastic speaker, and has become a wonderful colleague and friend. I am pleased to introduce Vitor Correa, who will be speaking to us today about using hard and soft power to basically secure access to raw materials. Vitor, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for this kind introduction that you just made. Sometimes it's strange to listen and talking about myself. So I'll be talking about um, the current situation that we have about the mineral raw materials and how can we secure the access to these raw materials. And the outline of my presentation basically has only three points. I'll be talking about soft and, um, and hard power. Uh, I'll be talking about trade, uh, the minerals and the metals flows and the way countries combine these flows and how can we deal with scarcity. So what are the different solutions, the different alternatives that different governments are trying to put in place? And just before uh, jumping into the hard and soft power issues, um, I'd like to, I, I enjoy this, um, this image very much because it shows, uh, to some of you it might not be news, but it shows how we, whenever technology is evolving, uh, how we are using more uh, minerals or more, in this case, more elements from the periodic table from the wood, uh, limestone and iron from the from windmills and from the sorry from windmills to 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 the steam engines to the uh, uh, explosion engine and lately with the with the energy transition we are using more and more elements from from the periodic table and of course it, this creates a lot of stress because no country has all the the minerals or all the elements that a sophisticated industry needs. And if we look back to the, to the world map and see what's the current situation, uh, we see that this is the case for Europe. This, we see that we are relying on, on many imports um, of what we now call critical raw materials coming from different places in the world. Um, and Again, uh, we might have these minerals uh, in different locations, but they are not feasible to explore because, again, the economics play, play its role. Um, and this is the case. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the Critical Raw Materials Act that was published uh, roughly two months ago was looking to, the, to, 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 to that reliance, to, to problems that we have in securing imports from these countries, not only because... Um, these are the, let's call it, uh, best uh, location producers, but also because we are now facing more competition for these resources. And sometimes competition, as you are seeing in this image uh, from the past, 
um, um, creates conflicts. And uh, the, the image on the left side is from the Japanese invasion of China, of Manchuria in, uh, um, uh, in the 30s. Um, and um, that is an exhibition of art power. Reason why Manchuria was invaded was because they had important resources. In that case, they had iron and coal, and these were the raw materials for steel. Um, and on the right side, you have the, an, a photo from the signature of in 1951 of the creation of the community for uh, coal and steel, and that was the birth of the European Union, as we have it today. Again, the European Union was created just to avoid uh, more wars in Europe. And uh, the wars that we had before were again because different countries were trying to have more resources. And these two examples are normally, I would say, the, the typical examples for uh, the illustration of what is art power relying on military capacity and soft power, which relies on diplomacy. But what really happens is at times powerhouses or powerful countries, and the US is an excellent example of that, it's the, 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 the most powerful country uh, when we are talking in military terms, it also is, it moves away from art power and try to use its, its influence and its diplomacy to influence the others. And in fact, you have been very successful in that since the Second World War. So these um, transitions between art and soft power, in a way, they, they are in a sort of line. Um, and sometimes we need to, to look to this line in a way that is more continuous. Let me talk about now about minerals and metals flows. And this is some uh, approach that we try to, to develop uh, at International Raw Materials Observatory. So we realize that you can have uh, combinations, different combinations, de depending on the geological endowment that you have. So you have countries that have... Uh, I mean, huge geological endowment, impressive. This is the case, for instance, of Canada or Australia. And you also have countries that have the scarce uh, geological endowments. So the small deposits, low grade, um, and really they don't have many options. On the other side, if you look to the size of the market or if you want the industry, you have countries like the US with uh, huge industry capacity and also huge markets. Um, and you also have um, countries that have huge markets, but again, with uh, scarce uh, raw materials. This is the case, for instance, of Japan. Japan, they have uh, important uh, industrial minerals or industrial mineral resources, limestone, and they, they, they produce a lot of cement for example, but on uh, metal mining side, uh, an important um, gold mine, uh, they rely on imports from, from other parts of the world. And depending on the way this, this, uh, this um, combination evolves, you see that you have different options. Here you have the map, and this is from the USGS, I believe from 2019 of the, of the import reliance is of, of the US. Basically, you see that the, 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 the most important partners from where you are importing resources are Canada and China. I'm not going to talk about China now, but if you look to the Canadian case, it's a sort of coupling because you have a developed industry, a huge market, and Canadians they have uh, impressive geological endowment. So coupling these two countries, it's perfectly normal. It's what they are doing. And if you look at it from the other side, also from the Canadian side, it's almost also normal. The US is responsible for uh, roughly half of their uh, export destinations. And, um, and we are talking here about mineral ores. So this stable regulatory framework that Canadians have, all these things are important for you in the US to, to combine this, this um, capacity from your next door neighbor. You see here that you have uh, major, uh, or, I mean, new players coming into, into Canada. This is the case for the European Union. Uh, since we signed CETA, so the, the, the trade free trade agreement with Canada uh, a couple of years ago, the European Union is trying to facilitate more and more um, imports from, from Canada, and they are now also trying to have more um, 
uh, if you want, uh, facilitate not only the imports, but also um, investments made by European companies in Canada. And of course, this creates a sort of competition uh, to, to companies that are based in the US, but uh, the European Union are not the only players. China was also trying to import materials from Canada. If you look to, to Australia, you see a very similar situation. Australia is a resource-rich country. Um, so it's one of these countries with an impressive geological endowment, and they used to export their uh, raw materials basically a few years ago, more to Japan, later on to, to South Korea. And these days, their main uh, partner, the trade partner is China. So all their uh, raw materials or the majority of the raw materials, they feed the, the Asian markets. So this coupling is one um, solution to countries that have this uh, geological endowment and also the ge geographic position. And then you have other countries like Japan who don't have uh, mineral resources or they have it in, in very limited amounts, but um, they have important uh, markets and they are also in important technology uh, providers and the case for Japan is a very interesting one. Um, they were one of the, the key countries that were uh, researched when we created the International Raw Materials Observatory back in 2017, because they were at that time already the leaders in recycling. So um, for that, they only have, they, they have not only the, the infrastructure, the, the recycling infrastructure, but also they also have the, the proper mindset. So the, the industry um, is aligned in a way that they try to minimize waste and they try to reuse everything. So they try to close that loop. And, um, and again, Japan is probably the best example in the world to, to most metals. They, they have impressive recycling rates. And this is a case of, of, um, of an economy that um, has to import raw materials. So the longer they keep them in the, in the loop, the better. It's also important to underline that they are exporters. And that's a problem because if they export uh, their cars, for instance, it's not uh, logic that uh, the cars and the batteries will, will be brought back to Japan. So this is these are the sort of challenges that they still have to face. And despite having so many and so sophisticated recycling uh, uh, processes and facilities and the infrastructure, they still need a lot of uh, uh, primary raw materials. And now the European Union. Well, these are the, what you see there in, in percentages are the, the, the imports um, percentages coming from these countries from for different for different commodities. And you see that we have a big problem here because we rely a lot on China, especially for all these um, uh, raw materials that we use in electronics and defense. Um, the European Union is, is also an important market. Uh, it's also an industrial powerhouse. I mean, it's we produce a lot of cars, a lot of equipments. Um, and uh, we have uh, we are probably one of the most uh, populated continents. Um, and because of that, we have also several challenges being one, the public opposition to mining. In Europe, uh, the, the policies so far have been on increasing recycling, trying to use less resources and relying on trade. Um, and uh, you see that if you combine this, and again, it's the same image that I was producing, you, you see that uh, the, the, your, the different policies or the different choices that countries uh, have can be basically framed into this table. And I was talking about resuming mining in Europe, but we have problems. And probably the, the biggest is the, the cost. If you compare the, 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 the full cost of the extraction of a commodity in Europe and the example that you have on the images on copper, you see that, um, and the, the, the orange line, the horizontal line uh, was the, 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 the ore price in the, in the stock market. You see that there are companies that are producing uh, already uh, above um, above cost. 
Um, and this means that it's very difficult for a, a, a mine uh, in Europe because of the, the costs with um, with the personal, the costs with the electricity or, or energy, and also the environmental costs to be competitive when compared to, to a mine in South America or to a mine in China. Uh, and it's not only because of course also the cutoff grades and the, the size of the of the mineral deposits is completely different. So we have here many challenges despite having important resources. Um, we have some exceptions. Uh, recently, you probably heard about the announcement of a rare earth project in Sweden, uh, close to Kiruna mine, but these are not uh, these are not the, the, the common uh, places. Also, I mentioned already that we have a, a strong public opposition. And the public opposition to mining in Europe, you might see this in, a, um, if you want, rooted in two things. One is that uh, you have uh, uh, a strongly populated uh, continent, as I said. And on the other hand, the European Union has been funding for more than 40 years um, uh, nature or if you want rewilding projects or nature conservation projects. So in a way, it's very difficult to tell people that for the last 40 years, we have been giving you money to farmers, to, to people living in remote sites to keep these sites as pristine as possible. And now we want to open a mine there. So we have roughly almost 40% of the of the land territory in, in Europe uh, under some sort of conservation or protection or nature protection uh, regulation. And this is a problem because whenever you want to open a mine, either you are close to a city or if you are on one of these uh, natural parks, you'll be having, um, I mean, a huge opposition, not necessarily from the people that lives nearby, but also from the people that lives in cities. So the, the urban people that is looking to that. Nevertheless, um, we have a lot of mines, and uh, of course, this is it's logical if you, if you just think that we have been mining Europe since Roman times. Most of them are closed. This is the, an example from Portugal. You have many closed mines, and one of the the, the areas, if you want, to, that research is now um, ex exploring is can we reopen these mines? Uh, most of them are flooded. In some cases, they were closed um, centuries ago. So we really don't know what's uh, left behind. And this is one of the uh, research areas, I would say one of the most relevant research areas. And research is the way the European Union is doing is, is, if you want, is the tool that the European Union is using to face these problems. So small deposits with higher costs for uh, exploitation, the public opposition, and also the, the low grade. And we are, when we are talking about research, uh, the European Union basically has one of the, I believe it's the biggest research uh, program in the world, an innovation and research program. It used to be Horizon 2020, these days is the uh, Horizon Europe. And there is um, a research uh, uh, stream that is basically focused on uh, raw materials. Um, in the period between 2014 and 2020, the European Union uh, invested in that stream for raw materials, roughly 600 uh, million euros, just in research projects led by universities or by research groups looking to ways to extract these critical raw materials in Europe. As I said, most of them uh, from uh, previously uh, exploited or abandoned mines. But the research pathways, and this is, um, um, if you want, a, a collection of the different research pathways that we have been looking at in these research programs. One of them, the, probably the most obvious one, is subsea mining. Um, the, the machines that you see in the, in the image were built in the UK. And at that time, it was before Brexit, the UK was still uh, part of Europe. And that company, BMC, was uh, participating in research projects funded by the European Commission. These machines were uh, later on uh, sold to Nautilus, to the, the Pacific, uh, uh, to the, that project uh, by a Canadian company named 
uh, nautilus in the Papua New Guinea area, which uh, apparently was not successful. So the company went bankrupt. And I, I the last time I, I heard about the machines, it was that they were uh, being uh, in some sort of auction. But subsea mining, nevertheless, is one area that, that might be feasible to countries like or uh, regions like the European Union where the mineral endowments are poor. Nevertheless, this also faces a lot of political opposition. Some countries um, are trying to use their own research capacities. This is an example from Germany, for instance, and Germany is trying to obtain uh, permits to mine in the sea in the Pacific. Um, but also, if you want, there is a sort of I would say uh, two faces perspective here because at the same time, the European Parliament recently banned uh, any um, uh, pilots on subsea mining in European waters. But nevertheless, uh, it's, a, it's a research area. The other one is about going deeper. And we have now projects, uh, uh, mainly projects using robots. Um, and these projects using robots, they, they are also playing on the size of the robots, because if you make a robot smaller than the actual mine size that you have, because in, in a common mine, the mine is built on human scale. So you have places for humans to, to walk, for dumpers, for excavators, for all the machinery to work underground. But if you reduce that size, then you can also reduce the, the amount of waste rock that you are extracting. And in some cases, uh, you have in Europe, we have the, the, the mineral deposits, but they are now at one or two kilometers depth, which is, I mean, uh, too expensive to go after. And these ultra depth mining projects are also, as I said, one of these research areas, because if robots can go there, even um, if they are not, uh, um, so I would say is not so productive because in most cases you are not ex using explosives. So it's just a sort of, um, of a tuning machine. So it's the, the pace is slower, uh, but nevertheless, if you are just targeting the higher raid zones, then it pays, the, it pays the effort. And again, you can also use that in small deposits uh, in very target areas. So it might be uh, something that might, I believe, be a, a game changer uh, if successful technology. Other approaches, and this is an image from uh, copper, um, um, copper leaching in Arizona. So this is not from Europe, it's from this that side of the Atlantic, is in place mineral recovery. In Europe, we are basically looking to lithium. Uh, there are several uh, projects in Cornwall, in the UK, also in Germany, uh, where um, research is being doing, uh, being made uh, to extract lithium from geothermal brines. In these cases, in most of the cases, they are trying to combine the income that the, the, the energy production already provides, and also looking to the scales, so to, to those salts that precipitate in the pipelines, and to try to extract the, the metals that are ready, already there. So in-place mineral recovery has one advantage as ultra depth and subsea mining in Europe. And the, the, the common uh, aspect of all these three approaches is that mines will be invisible. Again, uh, in, a, in a populated continent, people doesn't want to see a mine, so they want it to have it underground. And of course, underground is more expensive and not really suitable to some, uh, to, to some types of deposits. Again, this is part of the challenge. And in Europe, there is also people talking about space mining. As I don't know if you are aware, but in Luxembourg, uh, there is already some sort of up looking to space mining. In my opinion, but again, this is my personal opinion, it's not the observatory. In fact, I forgot to say that in the disclaimer in the beginning, these are, are my personal views. Um, it's a sort of um, of Avatar movie. So we have to, and the image is from the Avatar movie. So this might be feasible, but in, I mean, it's not for the next 20 or 30 years, that's for sure. And space mining, uh, looking for resource, uh, resources that we need in, in our planet in space, I believe it's, it's, it's a very far away um, option. The other option. So we talk about domestic supply, we talk about research, and the, the second option is trade. 
but here we have problems. As I said, we are relying on few countries, but we also have competition. And um, in, this is perhaps one of these examples where the cooperation between the US and Europe could be, uh, I mean, could be beneficial for both sides. Because what I see, and I remember being in the Democratic Republic of Congo a few years ago, and you guys, you had already the Dodd Frank Act, and the European Union um, came with this with this regulation uh, against conflict minerals, and suddenly in the DRC. The, the American buyers left the country, the European buyers left the country, and the only buyers who stayed were the Chinese and the Lebanese. But the Chinese mainly were profiting from the, from the, the absence of uh, more buyers, and they were pushing the prices lower, um, pushing the prices down, sorry, for the, for the uh, artisanal miners, because they, they were the ones producing most of the, the cobalt there. And this is a sort of, uh, of uh, I would say, uh, regulation of lack of communication, lack of, um, if you want, uh, cooperation uh, that opens space to others. Um, so I was basically using this uh, uh, resource nationalism uh, index uh, from Make from 2019. And uh, I use this image on purpose because one of the countries there in green is Chile. And I don't know if you have been looking to the news, but last week, the new Chilean pre president decided that lithium mines in Chile will be nationalized. So again, this resource nationalism index, even for countries that are now on green or that were on green a couple of years ago, things can change very quickly. Um, I mean, Russia was there already on, on red, so no need to talk about Russia. And here, is where you have this um, where you have this difference between hard power and soft power because what we have seen um, until recently is was that the the, the US was the, the I will say the, the driving force in the world you you are the the, the leading um, the leading um, economy uh, I will say in 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 a way you are the leading power. And now you are facing a challenger, and the challenge uh, to, to the US is China, as we are seeing in the news uh, every day. And what we notice is that the US that was having this very strong military capacity, and because of that hard power capacity, was moving to soft power. And now we see China use, doing exactly the opposite. China until recently, and if you look to the map on the right side of Chinese investment in, in Africa, you see the Chinese have been investing in Africa and, and in Asia for several years. They had this road and belt initiative. And in China and in Africa, they were quite successful because not many European countries were so proactive. The US was also not very, I mean, Africa is not so relevant to the US as it is South America. And in a way, they, that, there was a lot of space for Chinese there. And they were developing this Rose and Belt Initiative and actively buying minerals and doing infrastructure development in Africa, at least since 2012. And what we see now is that the Chinese are moving to a sort of art power side of the scale because they are now open in the open, uh, claiming that um, they can challenge the military uh, power of the US. And in my opinion, this is something that is very worrisome. Do you? Um, we don't have the military capacity. I mean, things are changing now with the with the invasion of Ukraine. So um, uh, even uh, European policymakers are now putting more main money on NATO, uh, trying to develop their own military capacity. And it might be that uh, this uh, soft power approach that uh, both European Union and this in, in, also in this image Japan were having, it might be moving to a sort of far power. But nevertheless, what we realize is that the country who is leading, so the country with the biggest military capacity, as long as it established as a as a as a power, uh, then it can move into soft power. And this is the sort of challenge that we are facing now in this soft art power line. And the I believe the, the big question, we can say the, the million dollars question is, are we going to some sort of conflict? 
or a sort of global resource war. And um, I believe we can have here two different options. One is yes, we are, and um, this is coming. Uh, it's coming because look at the Inflation Reduction Act on your side. You are, I mean, the the, the U.S. government is already trying to uh, have um, uh, bigger control over supply chains, and this is quite different from the liberal order that we had and that was established by by Reagan and that we had until recently. And if you look that to the recent um, events in Europe after the, the invasion of Ukraine, you see a sort of divide between NATO aligned countries. And this is, of course, the, the Western democracies also together with Australia, um, some countries in, the, in, in Africa and, and also in, in South America. But so the, the Western world, if you want to, in some ways, the democratic world, getting together and on the other side of the of the map or of you or if you or if you prefer on the other side of the trench we'll be having these autocratic regimes um apparently this is the sort of uh, global resource war that we'll be facing with uh, perhaps the institutions like the BRICS uh, becoming more uh, let's say um uh, bounded uh, uh, among them so looking to inside on on the other side and this is something that i believe we really need to to start investing on um big players these open democracies but it's also important to to underline that we are not playing uh, using the same rules i mean some of the of the things that we face in europe like in public consultations public opposition to mining all these things they do they do not exist in 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 autocratic regimes they do not exist in russia on the other sides uh, of the coin and answering to the same question we shouldn't be doing or we should be running into a global resource war and the reason why is very simple no country has all the mineral elements that a sophisticated industry need as i said before meaning that some of these raw materials i mean niobium it only exists in brazil so it does make sense to have some sort of divide uh, where we cannot have niobium and uh, the other block or the other uh, group of countries will be able to have niobium so in a way this uh, geological diversity in geological endowments the fact that only some countries have some raw materials it should be uh, working as a sort of uh, antidote to to a global resource war but i really can't say how this evolves. Uh, I believe we are on the brink of these two options. And if I may say just a few words closing now about the World Barometer. So the, the International Raw Materials Observatory, as, as the name says, observes. So it was created to look to best practice. And among the countries that we first, first look at was the US, but also Canada, Australia, Japan, and um, South Africa and Europe. And we are trying to understand how these countries were, uh, how they become more developed uh, when we are talking about mining. But um, um, after the end of the of this uh, initial research, what the, bar what the, the, the raw materials observatory uh, does now is observing. And one uh, resource that we publish for free every two weeks we call it the world barometer and this is a news digest you can go to the website you can you can register yourself to receive these news digests and we look to news that are coming not only from research or not only from geology side but also from politics or from the environment or from technology because we realize that we are not working in silos so a small change in some parts of the equation can have an impact on the overall system and this is it from my side. So thank you so much for your attention. And I'd be glad to have to, to respond some some questions in case you have them, of course. Thank you. Vitor, I'll, I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, <laughs> I have several, so I'm, I'm just going to pick one. Um, you very briefly mentioned robo miners. Uh, could you maybe expand on the role that you see artificial intelligence playing? Ah, yes. Well, um, Robo Miners is one of these research projects being funded uh, by the uh, European Commission. And uh, the, the aim of the project is to build up a, a machine 
Uh, now we are starting with a machine having the size of a small car, a small car in Europe, a sort of smart car. So um, um, if you want uh, uh, a big uh, uh, golf cart, something like that. And uh, um, that, uh, that machine will be able to be assembling and to uh, detect where the, the air rays uh, areas are and it will be basically excavating the, the rock, reaching that those areas, producing a sort of slurry, so a mix of, if you want, chips and water, because we are assuming we'll be having underground water, and pumping that slurry uh, up to the surface. This is the initial, this is the, if you want, the pilot, the, the proof of concept that we are creating. The aim is to evolve into something that will be the size of a Coca-Cola bottle. So assume something that we'll be having that you can put down the hole. It can go up to two or three kilometers down. And then from there, it will be basically uh, re, um, doing this excavation and progressing and using this in, in artificial intelligence capacity to decide how to work. And it will be not only one robo miner, but a swarm of robo miners. So working together. But we still have several challenges. And perhaps one of the most interesting challenges is not coming from the technology side, but it's coming from the geological side. So how can you design a mine where uh, a sort of, um, a sort of um, uh, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's like one of these, I'm trying to, to, to find the, the word, uh, uh, one of the uh, one of these li little insects that uh, mm. that excavates and progresses. So how can you uh, organize a mine in a way that uh, you organize the, the the different paths for that? Let's call it again that that small insect to go across and to extract the demineralized uh, areas in a way that uh, still facilitates the extraction of that um, of that slurry. And this is a big challenge. So the mine design is one of the things you, you have a group of people working there. But this is this can be a real game changer because if you change the, the size of the mine, and in that case, the mine will be completely invisible and you can have swarms of robots working 24 over 24 at two or three kilometers below a city. And people won't realize because the only thing you will be having at the surface will be this treatment, um, this um, uh, uh, these facilities to treat the slurry. So this might be one of these, uh, um, I would say, game-changing uh, projects. But um, I won't say that we'll be capable of having something already working in six years, but we might have something working in 20 years. I guess now the, the big question is how can we make that compatible with the energy transition timetable? Because the, what politicians are saying is that in 10 or 20 years, we need to become uh, carbon uh, neutral. Okay, thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Victor, for your, your presentation. I, I'm particular, particularly interested in hearing what organizations are working on supply lines for all of this long list of critical critical minerals. It seems that uh, the, long, the long road from mine to processing center, to refining center, to distributor, to end user, probably gets quite complex, particularly with sources in a variety of the countries you mentioned. Uh, could, could you point me towards organizations that, that might be working on, uh, on these issues to define and define more specifically exactly uh, where our critical minerals come from and how they how they get to to us here in the US uh, organizations or companies organizations ones that are looking at the big picture right okay uh, assuming this is the question Carl if it's not please okay you are unmuted again you are talking about organizations looking to the specific areas of the supply chains right Right. I imagine that this would be organizations. It might be government organizations. It seems to me likely that uh, with all the emphasis on critical minerals that there's already an effort underway. Mm -hmm. But it, it'd be interesting if you have any insight, Victor, on who or what it, what organizations are doing this. It'd be uh, helpful, I think, for many yes. of us in the audience. 
Thank yes, you. thank you so much, Carl, for, for the question. What's happening now is that mm, you have a sort of uh, policymakers looking or paying a lot of attention to the, to the issues of criticality because they realize that uh, supply chains might be in danger. Um, and for example, at European Union level, the organization that is doing the criticality assessments and looking closely to this, it's the Joint Research Center. So the Joint Research Center, if you want, is the is the science uh, arm of the European Commission. But then you have some ups um, that are looking uh, to some governments. For instance, the Germans, they have DIRA. DIRA is a sort of, um, I won't say a spin-off because they are still linked to the German uh, Federal Geological Survey. And DIRA has become very specialized in providing support to the industry, to the German industry, trying to tell them where they have or where they can access not only primary raw materials, but also alternative ways for processing. Because some of the challenges that we have is they are not only on the extraction of the primary raw materials. So it's not only on the geology, it's also on the processing side. And if you look to, to rare earths, it's a good example of that. Even if you are extracting rare earths in the US, and you are, they go to China to be processed. So all these uh, supply chain in ways is, of course, causing um, some some problems. Uh, in Japan, I will uh, underline the, the, the work or, of, um, um, uh, sorry, jo J J Japan is uh, Jork. Uh, no, Jork is the, sorry, I'm just mixing things. Jork is, of course, the Australian code. Um, the Japanese ministry, uh, it might be JORC as well, sorry. The Japanese Ministry for uh, Industry. Uh, JORC is working with the industry, with the Japanese industry, with the Keiratsu. Um, they have this sort of regular meetings to understand what is in the technology pipeline. So not only what are the minerals or, or what are the, what are the, um, the components or the, or the, the, the elements from the periodic table that they need today, but also what are the technologies that are already developing in the pipeline and that will be requiring different raw materials in three or four years uh, time frame. So in, in Japan, the, they have this different approach looking to the future that we don't have in, in Europe. I believe in the US, it's of course the, the USGS. And then you have some uh, uh, specialized uh, groups uh, or um, research uh, groups in Europe, we have Fraunhofer, um, for instance, probably one of the, the strongest. And you also have companies that are playing uh, basically on the side of the of transformation uh, of these materials. But uh, if you want, if you can contact me, and I will be glad to provide you more detailed information. Thank you. I see in the chat one of the questions we have. It comes from. Uh, Dan Ruggery, uh, he says, you mentioned that Canada and Australia have fast and efficient mining permitting and or their governments are behind mining. I feel or believe that this is the opposite in the United States. Uh, how are you able to speak to this and how might it affect the U.S. going forward? And, and I'm going to expand that maybe to include Europe, too, because I think in some ways we have parallel concerns. So, Vitor, could you could you maybe talk a little bit about how we would address this uh, permitting bottleneck, as it were? Well, I believe that you have one advantage in the US compared to Europe. And that's, I mean, your regulatory framework is much more stable than ours. If you look to the European regulatory framework, one of the problems that most of European countries have, with perhaps the exception of the Finns and the Swedish, is that every time you have a new government, uh, the new government will try to introduce a new sort of regulation and that affects permitting because most of these regulations will be tackling social or environmental issues. And basically, I mean, they just um, made permitting more difficult. This is the case uh, in most, I mean, Portugal is a good case for the lithium projects. We have huge lithium um, deposits. Uh, Portugal has been the, one of the biggest uh, lithium producers in the world. I believe it was the eighth or the, in the seventh or eighth position. Mm -hmm. But but it's so difficult to 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 obtain a permit 
Um, and it's becoming more and more difficult because, in the, again, using this as an example, in the last 10 years, the regulation changed three times and the US is not like that. This said, um, of course, we have very strict um, uh, regulations when we are talking to environment. Um, and again, I believe this is the way or perhaps one of the areas where governments will need to, to, to make some sort of adjustments. Because if you are competing with uh, companies that are extracting without having the same um, without having the same environmental constraints that we have in Europe or that you have in the US. And because of that, they can extract at lower prices and do dumping. This is the case again of China and many Asian countries and Africa, of course. Uh, and if these materials and these minerals are coming to Europe uh, and to the US, uh, there is a sort of distortion. So if a country wants, and now I believe this is the case for both US and and Europe to be having more reliant supply chains, you need to have domestic extraction, or you have to, or you need to have trade with countries where to, to whom you have very good relations. And for that, you need to be prepared to pay more. And um, one way of doing that is just trying to have to raise some sort of uh, barriers to trade for these ores that are and materials that are coming from countries. Do, that do not have the same stringent um, uh, conceptions. Nevertheless, this cannot be done today. And why? Because uh, China, that is the, the, the new kid in the block, they don't have these regulations, but they, uh, for some metals, they, um, uh, they are responsible for the processing of sometimes 90% of these materials. So we, we really don't have an, an option, at least for the next five to 10 years. Thank you. I, I did unmute a couple of people, Tony uh, with the Novus Group and Bill, um, you've both been given permission. Tony, I'm going to ask you to go first with your question, and then we'll follow up with you, Bill. So just hang tight. Great. Thank you, Aaron. And Vitor, thank you for your presentation. And you. you're covering so many topics that as I'm here with my hand up, you're sort of answering and addressing some of these things. So bear with me, because when you're talking about hard power and soft power, Obviously, both of those options are very expensive options. And so I'm curious as a geologist, as a geophysicist, that are you seeing some nations start to come to their senses, realizing that a lot of the elements or minerals that they require may be right there in their own backyard? And therefore, what can you let us know about, is there a resurgence in geology and geophysics and exploration to focus in your own backyard to try the try to find these elements, which would be a much cheaper alternative than hard or soft power. Yes, yes, Tony, definitely. I have no question about that. Um, what we are seeing now, and we are seeing this um, in all countries that are now looking to China, um, with at least some um, <laughs> with some sort of, um, I would say. Uh, a bit of uh, uh, worries. Um, what we see at, is that all these countries are now investing in, in more exploration. That does not necessarily mean that they will be having mines. And again, um, using at the case of Europe, I believe that Europe will try to still rely on this soft power approach and trade. But as soon as you have, um, as soon as you open, uh, rare deposits in Sweden, then you won't be um, cornered because you don't have uh, rare earths at all. So it will be a completely different situation, even if you don't act, extract these rare earths or even if you extract only small amounts. Nevertheless, and this is coming from the barometer, I realize uh, a news coming from the US a couple of weeks ago of a um, rare earth project, um, uh, better saying an Australian company doing an exploration in the US for a rare earth project that was seen on social media, a lot of public opposition to their project. Mm -hmm. And that public opposition on social media was not really mirrored into public opposition on the field, on the site. And they uh, hired an um, uh, IT company to try to understand what's happening. And basically these were boot accounts that were tracked into China, into the 
in, in fact, into the government of China, into the Chinese Communist Party. And the reason why the Chinese Communist Party was trying to create this sort of social unrest uh, around that uh, rare earth project was that it's not good to Chinese uh, to have more rare earth projects coming out uh, across the world because in a way that undermines their uh, leverage, so their their bargaining power. Yeah. Um, so what I see is that we'll be having, yes, more efforts, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the mines will be open. But as soon as we have that possibility, of course, we'll be having a completely different capacity for negotiation. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And Bill, if you if you still have your question, I have um, given you permission. You will have to unmute yourself. And then you can go ahead. Okay, I'm not I'm not hearing from Bill, um, so I, I will pull one more question from the chat. And can I? Okay, oh, I think I can did you, you get hear it? me now? Yeah, we've got you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Thank you very much. I've kind of picked up that one of the big drivers of populism in the United States is people just not feeling that their children are going to have a better life than they have economically. Uh, I live in Arizona. I went to a really good SME meeting uh, just a week ago. They had the state mine inspector, really good guy, and he was suggesting uh, one of the things to promote mining is point out that people have figured out that, uh, for example, you could get college degrees, become a teacher and earn 60,000 a year in Arizona, or you could take your high school degree and drive a haul pack in an open pit mine and earn $90,000 a year. Uh, I, he, and he was suggesting really promoting that's one of the points to really promote on mining. I've worked in several companies, countries in Latin America. It's given me, I grew up in a rural farming town in Idaho. It's given me real pleasure to see local people become prosperous from mining jobs. Is there anybody that is pushing, any group that is pushing that kind of theme? And do you think it would work? That's my question. You can unmute me or you can mute me now. Thank you so much, Bill. Well, the only group I know that is doing that for some time is in Canada. It's the Mining Matters educational program. And that might explain also why the public opposition to mining is not so big in Canada as it is in other locations. Uh, I also... I believe, if I may also, um, I believe another problem that we have in mining is that we have this disconnect between the goods that we use and the industry, so the mining industry. And what I mean by that is that, uh, I, I don't know, I, I'm 56 years old, and sometimes I see children, and I'm assuming that you also have heard about that, that they don't realize that uh, the chicken nuggets in McDonald's, they came from real live animals, um, or that uh, spaghetti does not grow in trees. So this sort of disconnect exists in agricultural products, so in food, and it also exists in mining. And there is another problem is that we are not paying a fair price. If you consider, the, I mean, the, 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 the cost of, um, of a fork, um, the cost of a fork might be a couple of dollars. And if you consider the amount of rock that you need to extract just to create one fork, and uh, and uh, all the process that goes with it. Uh, and also, the, I mean, if you look to the entire value chain of that, you come to the conclusion that we are not paying sometimes the fair prices for the goods that we have. And on top of that, people does not realize that to have a fork or a knife, which you use to, to have your meals every day, this is coming from a mine. And that disconnect in a way, um, is, um, in my opinion, the root for that opposition to mining. So people, they haven't seen mines, at least in the developed world, not only in Europe, but in the US, because after the, I believe it was in 1981 or 1986, that Reagan had that G7 meeting in, um, in the US, 
uh, and it was the beginning of uh, of liberal of the liberal order of liberalism and then we just uh, basically we started importing and we stopped the domestic mining and we started importing from third countries and we in many areas in europe and i i believe the same in the us there are most populations they never had the contact with the mine so they they always see it as a negative uh, issue they don't realize that that brings pro prosperity to a community and they don't realize that they really need the tools or they really need the goods that that mine enables and these two things as you said the lack of perception of the prosperities uh, that mines can offer and also the disconnect i believe that they they justify a lot of the public opposition we see thank you okay Victor, i'm going to finish up with one final question we've got just a few minutes left um in a discussion i had with one of our past officers uh, we talked about the fact that colorado really it, it, it's potentially mineral rich but we've never seen modern prospecting applied to colorado uh, and i think that case can be made in many locations throughout the world do you have a a sense for the undiscovered mineral potential that might be waiting to be tapped uh, if we were able to explore using modern exploration and geophysical methods? Well, uh, again, this is a personal opinion. I believe we have a lot still to discover. Um, in some areas, I, I confess, I don't know if this is the case for Colorado, but in some areas, the exploration was basically uh, dealing with the, with the the first, let's say, 200 meters below ground. And this is not much, as we know. Um, again, uh, it's also understandable why they were not looking deeper, uh, because if they look to the, that uh, total cost curve, uh, and if you look to the to the market price um, of some metals, you just realize that it's better to extract them in Asia or in South America, because I mean, huge deposits still exist. But nevertheless, I do believe that we have a lot to find, but this might be deeper or smaller deposits. But if they are small and have a high grade, or if they are deeper and have a high grade, then the country who has the technology will be the winner of that race. And technologies like the use of these robots can be uh, game changers. Thank you very much, Vitor. I appreciate the time and effort that you gave to AIPG today. I wanna to thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone uh, that is, if you are on for the full webinar, you should receive a link in your email. Uh, and when you receive that link, you'll be able to download your certificate. Uh, I truly appreciate that. And uh, Vitor, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming. Next month will be, um, it's going to be Jacob Anderson, and he's going to be talking about using big data and how we can apply big data to mining and exploration projects. So I look forward to that as well. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Victor. So bye bye, bye bye, everyone. Goodbye. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.